Good day to all, and thank you, Dirk Van Hart, for coming and being with us today and sharing your lengthy knowledge about CCC camps in New Mexico. But we also want to know about CCC. Who or what was the CCC? Now, most, a lot of people know about who that was, and they've got family members that were in it. But that was one of the very first programs that Franklin Roosevelt uh, got started because as a tree farmer, a lot of people don't know that he was a tree farmer, he felt we had to do something to save the land and the trees and all. And uh, <clears throat> so he was inaugurated on March the 4th of 1933. And he created a program that was called the Energy Conservation Work Corps. And it was done in March of 31. And from that, they pulled together a new program where they could hire young men that were totally jobless, that were homeless in some cases, and also uh, World War I veterans that um, needed work. Everybody needed work. And we needed help on our land, this United States of America. So they created the CCC June 26, 1937. And in order to get into that, to be, get a job, at which they paid you a dollar a day. And you had to be, your family had to be destitute. And your, um, <clears throat> you had to be at least 18 to 25 years of age. And then later they changed it to 17 to 28 years of age. You had to be at least five feet tall and uh, six feet, six inches. If you were taller than that, I guess you couldn't get in. You had to weigh at least 107 pounds, and some of them didn't. They didn't, but they ate a lot the night before they were going to be weighed in. And you could not have any communicable disease, and you had to have at least three serviceable and normal working masticating teeth. I think that's so hilarious. <laughs> then, of course, they hired people to teach these young men and the others and another group to be labor, train them in labor, different jobs. And they got, with all that work, those boys, once a month, got <clears throat> $5 a month. Because the family that was destitute got the other 25. Now, I met, as has Dirk, some of those guys that it indicated when we met them, they were 80s and 90s. And some of the 80s, I wondered, how did they get in? And uh, I asked them, to, a number of them in various places. And they said, well, because my dad lied about my age, or no, my mom lied about my age, because they needed that $25 to pay for food and stuff to take care of the rest of the family. So it was a very important program just to be able to get into for a lot of reasons. And what came out of it, you're going to find out now with Dirk sharing all of the things that he knows about in terms of all the camps that were created here in New Mexico and what they did in those camps. So Dirk, I would uh, like to just ask you, how the heck did you get into this? <laughs> well, I, it was serendipity. Oh. Um, back uh, in 1997, uh, I live in Albuquerque. And uh, back in 1997, I retired for the first time. I retired three times. <laughs> I don't the know final that. was 2003, but in 97, I kept getting calls after work. In 97, I had some time, and I'm a retired geologist. 
And something that always fascinated me was a particular problem in the northwestern part of the Sandias, on the north northwestern part of Albuquerque, in the Albuquerque area. And there's a, a few picnic grounds up there, Montebo and La Cueva. And in the course of my work, I kept running across a stone building, uh, like a little office. And uh, there was no signage uh, right off the road that goes in there. Uh, sometimes it's called the Wantabo Cabin. Uh, but the, no signage whatsoever. And I kept wondering what this was. I kept tripping over this. <laughs> and I saw a, a ranger one day, and I asked him, uh, what is this thing? What is, the, what is that? It's always got something to do with the CCC. And I looked at him, and I thought, well, what is the CCC? I, I'm i kind of a history buff. I always have been. And I didn't know what the CCC was. Oh, I was God. embarrassed. <laughs> I was embarrassed. But anyhow, I, I, I looked up, uh, oh, there was a, an article in the opinion part of the paper. A letter was written in. And some guy was saying, we ought to bring back the CCC. Bingo. So here's a name. Maybe I can ask him. And I looked up his name in the phone book. I got a, an address and I wrote a letter to him. And he called me. He said, oh, I'm so-and-so. Uh, uh, would you like to come to one of our meetings? Meetings? <laughs> and I learned I had monthly meetings of this group of CCC alumni. Boys, so I was going to say boys, boys, boys yeah. they're all men, <laughs> uh, who had been in the CCC. And uh, I went, and uh, it was in February of 98. And from that day, I, had, I was with them for 20 years. God, you all did so and, much. And uh, soon my wife joined us. We became associate members. And after about five years ago, I became the president, <laughs> yeah. which is not an elective competitive office for volunteer. And I was with them to, to the, the uh, chapter disbanded. In fact, the guys all died yeah. in 2018. Yeah. So I got to know quite a bit about it. Oh, yeah. And I started wondering where all these camps were. And I got into this project of locating them all documenting and photographing and learning about them. And that's what is the subject of this little slideshow I'm going to show. Okay, it's also the subject of a book that you have written. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's so book here, and I'll, and I'll note it also at the very end of this okay, presentation. Good. This is available. It came out uh, in early 2020, just in time for COVID. <laughs> and uh, anyhow, it's available from Amazon. And it, it's got all the camps, lots of pictures. Uh, you like it. It's a good book. Oh, I agree. <laughs> totally. I've read every bit of it. Um, and it's a great reference, really a good reference. If you happen to be somebody who knew that your grandfather or your great uncle or somebody was in the CCC, get this book and find out where he worked mm -hmm. and what he did. Yeah. I mean, it's not identified by boys' names, no. but if you know what area he worked in, no. and if not, give Dirk a call and he'll figure it out for you. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, all right. Thank you so much. Now let's get into okay, we can get what started. you can do to tell us all about these camps that are all with us today, not as, quote, camps, but they're with us because of all the things those men did. Um, and like you said, they always like to be called the boys, uh, but the ones that you took care of in terms of monthly meetings were in their 80s and 90s. Oh, yeah. They were, they were a lot of guys. <laughs> okay. Uh, here's our title. And uh, the focus of this uh, little talk today is where the camps are, where they're located and what's, what's left today, uh, what condition they're in and a few of those that are worthwhile visiting. So let's go. Here's our menu for today. Um, I'm gonna go over some essentials, talk about the camps, what they were, some examples, eight of them. The CCC alumni movement, which is would be toward the end, and, and a few words about sources. And most of uh, this presentation will be about uh, numbers two and three. Okay, this is good. 
this is the first of five essentials. Now I warn you, most of this presentation are pictures and diagrams. Only in the beginning here with this introduction do I have a lot of these text uh, slides. I don't like those. We're stuck with a few of these to get started. Anyhow, essential number one, as Kathy said, the CCC got officially inaugurated in March 31, 33, uh, right in the middle of the Great Depression. And uh, in the beginning, it was called emergency conservation work, but later on, 1937, it became known as the Civilian Conservation Corps. And that's the way we think of it uh, today. Number two, by July of 33, the U.S. Army, now the U.S. Army was deeply involved in this. They, they recruited 250,000 young men, organized them into companies, so 200, and placed them in camps scattered around the country, about 1,000 forest service camps. This is in the beginning now. So this was a serious business. Number three, the, the total run of the CCC was from 33 to mid-42, nine and a third years, and something like three million young men went through this program. At first, the ages were 18 to 25, but later was expanded to 17 to 28. Uh, plus some World War I vets, and they operated like 4,500 camps nationwide. This is a big deal. Number four, in New Mexico, this is going to be our focus today, something like 55,000 young men were involved, 32,000 of them state residents. And in New Mexico, there were 90 physical locations where the camps were located, 90. Although, you, when you go for anyone doing the history of this project, we'll find 119 named camps. That's because some of these sites were used more than once. And a different company would come in that changed the name and use the same camp. And therefore, we wound up with more names than we do camps. But 90 physical locations are mainly what we're dealing with today. And number five, enlistment for these young men were for six-month periods. That's what they're called, periods. And uh, they, they were divided into winter, spring, and summer, fall. The boys were allowed to re-enlist or re-up for, for a total of four for two years. Uh, they were paid 30 bucks a month. That's equivalent to around $640 today, a month. And uh, half of this, of 20, excuse me, 25 bucks of that had to go to their family. I got a little mistake right there. And uh, a couple of comparison of numbers that are interesting at this point. 30 bucks a month would be equivalent to $3.70 an hour, figuring a 40 hour work week in a month. And today we're talking about a minimum wage of 15 bucks. These guys weren't paid too much, but they were uh, fed, clothed, uh, somewhat cared for, uh, uh, housed and uh, these camps are a little word might be valuable here these were run by the army but they weren't military like camps the army realized that these kids were not recruits in the military so they weren't treated like grunts in the military but, but they were given some discipline self-discipline and they had to do things on time so they were taught Self-discipline. Okay, everyone's heard of the greatest generation. Uh, it was forged by three important momentous events. First, of course, was the Great Depression, 1929 to 1941. The CCC in, in there, 1933 to mid-42, that's our subject today. And of course, World War II. 1941 to 45. These three things made the greatest generation. And after the war, they became the boomers and built the world that we live in today. Here's something that I find kind of amusing in a way. 
Back in 1998, the newsman Tom Brokaw published a book called The Greatest Generation. He said not one single word about the CCC. He focused on World War II. I mean, it was vastly important, no question about it. But the CCC pro provided a cadre of men who had some discipline, who had to take orders and give them. They had skills, they could do things. And one of the reasons we won World War II was because we had this well-trained cadre of old, slightly older men who became the core of the non-commissioned officer corps. This was immensely important in World War II. Tom Brokaw never said a word about the CCC. Shame on him. <laughs> okay, here's our menu again. And now we're going to talk about the camps, what they were and where they were. Here's where they're located, just the state of New Mexico. The red dots are the sites of camps. I notice they, all the yellow counties, these are the counties that had uh, camps in them. Uh, the few counties that had no camps are the white ones. Uh, I've superimposed the interstates on here. They didn't exist at the time, but that's just for reference. Uh, you notice up in the corner of Sandoval County, uh, slightly uh, north and left of center, there's no uh, Los Alamos County yet. That wasn't formed until later. But anyhow, this is uh, where the camps are located today. We're going to come back to this map a couple times. It's important to remember that these camps are not like your typical Girl Scout camp or Boy Scout camp. These were small towns. Uh, they required a good amount of space, eh, 20 acres or so. That's a lot of space. Uh, as level as possible. Space had to accommodate about 200 people, a little bit more sometimes. They had to access by all weather roads, so it can't be out totally out in the boondocks too much. It has to be supplied. And people have to get in and out of work areas, to and from. Uh, they had to have a water supply somewhere, a spring nearby or, or a well, something like 3,000 gallons a day. That was a serious concern. And this was uh, this determined where camps could be oftentimes. And they cost a lot. Uh, somewhere around $30,000, this in 1935 or so. That would be equivalent to $350,000 to $400,000 today. This, these were serious camps. And this whole program was a serious effort. Here's a chart showing the number of camps in New Mexico. And these things on the bottom are the, the periods, the six month periods. The reds are the summers, uh, spring, and the blue are, are the fall winters. Notice that started out kind of modestly. The first few years, the first two years, uh, something like 15 camps spread around, mainly in the forest, the national forest. It was a big jump in 1935. Everyone realized that the CCC was a winner. Everyone was supported. It was good. It was a win-win for everyone. And the number of camps shot up to around 45 or 40 average. And that lasted for about eight years as the, the rumbles of war in Europe start to be, started to be heard. All well, the camps dropped. And finally at Pearl Harbor, well, they plummeted and the CCC was shut down in the middle of 42. So at any one time, you had a significant number of these camps operating. And remember, keep in mind that each one of these had about 200 people. So you had a lot of people involved in this, a lot of people. Here's the strangest thing. And now this is all part of the introduction. Uh, each CCC camp was administered by two entities. It's hard to imagine two government entities somehow working together, but they did. One was some federal government agency that decided what work needed to be done by these guys. And two, the U.S. Army, who housed, fed, and generally cared for the enrollees, or they were called the boys. So these two entities work side by side. A little review, the U.S. Army mobilized, transported, organized the, the companies, 
Uh, they constructed the camps. They trained and fed the guys. The agencies from the Departments of Agriculture, Interior, and Labor, uh, they did the planning and organization of the work to be done on the public lands. These were public lands now. This is where the work was done. So these things, somehow they got through turf wars and, and personality conflicts, and they somehow worked well together. I think that's amazing. Okay, back to this map. On this map, you can't see this. This map is not meant for you to see, but you notice by each red dot, there's some numbers and little figures above it. That's a camp name. And each camp had a unique name. And this is a little anatomy of these names. Each camp name began with the initials of the federal agencies, the agencies that define the work to be done. Down here in New Mexico, they had BR for Bureau of Reclamation, Division of Grazing, or later became called the Grazing Service. That later became the, the BLM. The Forest Service, the National Parks, the Park Service. SES, the Soil Conservation Service, that started in 1935. They were very important in New Mexico. And State Parks. So the anatomy of a, of a CCC camp name. Something like that. Here's what, just one example. SES 8N. SES is the Soil Conservation Service. Number eight was the sequential number of that camp in New Mexico. And N for New Mexico. Some of the other agents like, agencies like Bureau of Reclamation, they numbered sequentially for all of Western, uh, the Western U.S. So they have larger numbers, 50, 60, 70. Uh, but others just have sequential numbers in New Mexico. That's how the camps were, were identified and named. This is something to keep in mind. This is 1930s now. We live in a different world today. Uh, the CCC was almost exclusively for young, single, white men. There was one camp for women. It only lasted a very short time. It was mainly for young, single, white men. To illustrate that point, look at this. This is a, one of those typical group uh, photos, and they're all over the place. And unless you have a relative or grandfather or someone in there, they don't mean too much to you. And, but I want you to notice there's an anomaly in this picture. Can you spot it? Look at it for a second. Can you spot something? unusual or, or out of place. Okay, let's, here it is. Notice on the far right, four black boys set in the side. We have no idea what the role was, no idea of their names, but most of the camps had all white. Occasionally, I guess this one here had uh, a few guys, I don't know what they did. Uh, this camp, by the way, was in Oklahoma, not in New Mexico. That's where I got my example. But that's that was the 1930s world. Okay, what do we mean by a camp? What would one look like? Remember I said before, these were small towns. They were all laid out in some orderly way. This is the Army way. And here are a few examples. They are laid in, out in a grid. You notice they got them. Long buildings, they were mainly for dormitories. Uh, you see in the upper left, the upper right. Uh, and they're, they all have a rectangular structure. They're laid out with a courtyard in between, uh, in the middle, pardon me. And there was a courtyard with a flagpole there. Uh, camps had, uh, all the buildings had to be accessible. There were offices there, were, were vehicle uh, garages. There were workshops, there was a medical building, there was a mess hall, there was a latrine. Uh, all these things had to be reached uh, by foot by the, uh, by the people at the camp. So they did have to be laid out in an orderly way. Okay, what to look for? Here are a few things. Uh, the upper left, foundations. There's an example of the Sandia Park. Uh, upper right, the root cellar. Occasionally you see these. Not every camp had these, 
but a few did. And they, I guess they would store vegetables and perishables there. Uh, they they did have to supply these camps regularly uh, by truck, but they uh, they stored some things to reduce the, the truckage. Down the lower left, you see some perimeter stones. These were walkways, uh, keep out of the, the mud. And they, most of these had fine gravel in them. Uh, these were pathways to get from one place to another in the camp. And in the lower right, there's a shower. You had to have a shower. And that little square thing in the, on the left margin is where they stepped in uh, at the entrance of the, the bathhouse to wash their feet for, for athletes' foot. They had to bathe their feet before getting into the shower with, with the rest of the guys. Anyhow, you see these in a number of camps. Uh, here's up the upper left. You see these two little square thing. There's another one in the center somewhere further away, and there's another one, one of those little square things in that the clump of bushes to the, the upper or to the to the right there. These were the supports for a windmill. And down below it you see a extant windmill. This is what they look like and they had to have some supports to keep them steady. The upper right you have these little circular structure. That was a flagpole stand. Occasionally you see that this was the center of the camp. And then in the lower right, a couple of massive concrete supports. Sometimes you see chunks of rebar sticking out of these. Some kind of heavy equipment, maybe their generator or a diesel tank of some sort. Uh, you see a lot of these. You don't always know what they are. And here's another one. This is a mystery to me. Uh, for a long time, I thought this structure in the upper right uh, uh, upper left, pardon me, was some sort of a, a barbecue grill, but it seemed awfully small for 200 men. And, I, and there are a couple of other examples shown there, all the same idea. On the lower right, you see one with, in the four uh, windmill posts to the upper right of it. Uh, but anyhow, what are these things? For the longest time, I didn't know. Until I ran into this old photograph. This one here is from Camp Cody. This is a World War I military camp west of Deming. And this was a response to uh, Pancho Villa's raid in uh, southern New Mexico. And this camp was uh, put up there. It was a massive camp. But anyhow, here's this structure. And sure enough, it's an incinerator. And it was right next to the uh, mess hall. And uh, that looks like our structure down below there. So these were incinerators, and the, and the tip is, if there's an incinerator, a mess hall had to be close by somewhere. So little clues, you see, and after a while, you start knowing what these things are. Another feature, these camps, of course, were barracks. These guys had to live somewhere. And these wooden barracks, you see in the on the right there, uh, they were up on stilts, no foundations. Uh, uh, oftentimes these were prefab, thrown up real quickly. They had uh, uh, you know, furnaces inside uh, for heat. They had the cots spread around. About 50 boys would live in each one of these. So they had at least four per camp. And when the camps were abandoned, uh, these wooden structures were torn out and there's no trace of where these barracks were because there's no foundations. So you have to assume where they were. Okay, back to our menu. Now we're going to look at some camp examples. We're going to look at eight of them, eight out of the 90. Sample number one, Division of Grazing number 42 in the Augustine Plains, west of Socorro. This is a fascinating camp. Here's a Google Earth image, a vertical Google Earth image. And north, that you see on the upper right, there's a north direction shown, that little circle. And running across the top is US 60. To the right is the little town of Magdalena. It's some miles off to the, the right. And this is the main road going through here. Uh, branching south, slightly southwest of uh, uh, interstate uh, of US 60 is the access road to the VLA, the very large array. 
And you see on, on the left side, and I put a little yellow sign there saying VLA. Notice the triangular pattern of the, the uh, radio telescopes going to the north and then one to the southwest and one to the southeast. Then at the bottom, you notice what I indicated as old US 60. Yes, old US Route 60 used to run along there. And the road you take from that access road to the visitor center uh, and the business center of the VLA is a part of old Route 60. Now, at that intersection at the turnoff to the VLA at the bottom there, if instead of going west, you look to the right, you're going to see a, a windmill and some scraggly trees. That's the old camp. And you can just drive there, the old Route 60, uh, the pavement is all broken up, but it's, it's no problem whatsoever. You don't need a high-centered vehicle or four-wheel drive. Just drive out there. This is a fascinating camp. And there's absolutely no signage whatsoever. Nothing. Here's a picture taken there. I think the contrast is exquisite. <laughs> Look at that radio telescope that's on the southeast arm of that big triangle. And here's a, one of the features of these camps. It's a grease wreck. And uh, two CCC boys, CCC alumni, I took out here in 2003. And that guy standing on top of it, his name is James Langley. He was at this camp. He, it's the first time he had been there in 65, 70 years. And he was put in a leadership position. He had a small crew of guys working for him. He's the guy and his crew that planted those trees. And the trees are pretty scraggly today. There's no water supply. I'm surprised they're still alive. Must be a source of water somewhere. I see some cattle on the side. It must be a, a, a pen somewhere for a, a water vat. Anyhow, this is a fun place to, to visit. You can make a day to com combine a visit with the VLA, and then come over here and look at the old camp. Here's camp number two. This is in Santa Fe. Two camps, SP, that's State Park, number one N, and SES, Soil Conservation uh, Camp, number 17. Now, these camps, I call one example because they were side by side, right next to each other, but they had nothing to do with each other. They had different sort, uh, different projects. Uh, they didn't really communicate that much. Uh, I guess they had to communicate somehow because they were right next to each other. But they went their separate ways. Here's a little topo map, topographic map of the northern part of Santa Fe. There's Route 85 running north, south, right through the middle there. Uh, I go Freya Street cutting across. But on the upper left there, is the Frank Ortiz Dog Park. It's kind of a high area, no, no trees going on. And I thought for a while that had to be the camp uh, or the site of these two camps. It was just too obvious until I start talking to one of the CCC boys. His name was Carl Walker. He lived here in Santa Fe for many years. He was in that camp. He worked at SP1N. And he said, no, that camp is not a Frank Ortiz dog park. It's down the hill. And it's covered by a housing development, a Casa Solano subdivision. Well, <laughs> sure enough, I did some more research and found some old photographs. And, and the site of these two camps was roughly where that yellow box is today. And uh, this, this area has quite a very interesting history. <laughs> Here is a picture taken from the dog park looking down to the southeast. At the top is a picture of the camp, the two camps. I'm not sure where the dividing line is, uh, but uh, down below is the modern scene, and you see those red connecting lines or connecting similar points just for reference there. Uh, not a trace left today. Not a trace. And not only were there two camps side by side, you remember 200 people per camp, 400 people. This camp was used as a Japanese internment camp after World War, or after Pearl Harbor. And 
they had as, as four to five thousand Japanese in, internees here. These were American citizens now. These were not POWs. These were American citizens of Japanese extraction. And they were housed here for a number of years. Uh, up on top of the hill, from where I'm taking this picture down below, you see in the lower right, there's a stone monument. And on that monu monument is a plaque uh, telling something about the internment camp. Uh, not a word is said about the CCC camps. So this, this history here on top of history, uh, I think it's very sad history, but there it is. That was example two. Now example three, Forest Service 22N, F-22, a battleship rock in the Hamas Mountains. I had a tough time finding this camp. Uh, oftentimes, uh, modern day campsites are built on top of CCC camps. So the first place I started to look were modern campsites and there are a whole bunch of them in the Hamas. And I kept looking and kept looking and I didn't see any foundations anywhere. There should be a trace of a camp somewhere, came up dry, came up dry. And then I stumbled onto this map, an old 1937 topographic map. And look there, I have an inset and I enlarge it in the lower right, Battleship Rocks CCC Camp. Down in the lower uh, left of, the, of the Highway New Mexico 4 is Soda Dam. You can just barely make out the letters there. But Battleship Rock CCC Camp, and I circled a little some some uh, structures that were indicated on this old topographic map. Well, let's take a look at this. It's a modern Google Earth image. There's Battleship Rock in, in the center right, and in, in the the left, lower left, is the YMCA Camp Shaver. That is built on top of the Battleship Rock Camp. Not a sign of any sort indicating anything about the CCC camp. But there it was. Okay, example four. This is an interesting one. Division of Grazing, camp number 37. Remember 37 doesn't imply that there are at least 37 DG camps in the, in the state. DG uh, 37, number 37 was sequential for all Western US. Anyhow, this is by the community of Cuchillo. And this is west of today's TRC. Back then, TRC was called Hot Springs. I had a tough time finding this camp. Uh, I, didn't, I really didn't know where to look. I had this photo at the bottom showing uh, the camp. And I assumed it was a north view. I wasn't even sure of that. Uh, I started driving around, driving around uh, west of the little town of Cochillo, and I stumbled onto this old road, a gravel road, and there, there's a, a, a sign that saying CC camp. I call that a clue. And sure enough, we drove out there, I think it was about five miles or so. Very passable road. It's a gravel road, but it's fine. And we found the camp. And I'm only going to show uh, one little feature of it, this one here. Uh, this little circular structure, I think it was some sort of a fountain. I think one time I had a little cabin on top of it. But there was something extremely interesting about this thing. By that yellow arrow at the top, I've enlarged it at the bottom. There, there were some initials. And I as, uh, amplified those initials a little bit with white. T.A. Thunderbird. It's all I could make out. What is that? I didn't know what that was, but I did have an old 1936, what was called an annual for the CCC camps down here. And they had this picture of some of the company right there that, and below it, a whole bunch of names. The names are not matched with the people in the photograph, but I looked at down that list and I found T.A. Thunderbird, Brownwood, Texas. I wonder if the Brownwood family out there in Brownwood knows anything about their grandfather or great-grandfather's 
epitaph uh, in the boondocks of New Mexico. Probably not. I found that fascinating, though. I, I like these little stories. I love them. Here's another one. Camp, uh, example number five. Division of grazing number 40. Carrizozo. Here's another Google Earth image. Uh, that's US 54 on the right. Uh, and about a half mile uh, down to the southwest, the lower left of the photo, is the northern edge of the town of Carrizozo. And there's a pull-off. You see, I've indicated the historical highway marker right there. It's a pull-off, and it's a little historic sign. And right across the street, however, there's a CCC camp. Look at all these structures. Look at all these little square things. Look at the down uh, in the lower half of the photo or the, the barracks location. No foundations, but marks from hundreds and hundreds of footfalls were made to pack the soil there. There are structures. There's a big fireplace, which is uh, shown in a modern picture, the lower picture at the lower left. And in the main picture, there's identification showing where the fireplace is and where the photo was taken. At that pull-off, that highway pull-off and historic marker, it talks about the, the glories of modern Carrizozo. Not a word about the CCC camp right across the street. Not a word. And this is on state land. I know you're not supposed to access state land. It's, it's really not public land. But I snuck through the barbed wire fence and walked out there anyhow. And I don't think I'll get and he knocks on my door in the time soon, but uh, I did it. And uh, it's up to you if you do it or not. I think it was fascinating to walk around this place. Though. But you can see the fireplace from the road. And if you're looking in that direction, you'll probably wonder, wow, what is that thing? We're at the CCC camp. Notice on the far right, there's the railroad. And just to the left of it, you see an old road. That's the old US 54. The old highway used to parallel and run right next to the railroad. It's been moved to the, the west, to its present location. So there's another interesting story about a camp. Number six, Forest Service 54, Cedar Creek. Well, my experience has been that oftentimes, like I said before, uh, a lot of these modern campgrounds are built on top of CCC camps. This is in Rio Rosa. So when my wife went, wife and I went down here looking for this camp, first thing we did was go to the Cedar Creek Campground in the in the, the, the National Forest. Well, we drove out there uh, northwest of the town of Rio Rosa, looked and we looked, couldn't find any foundation. We couldn't find any trace of a camp. We couldn't find anything. And we drove back down the hill to the end of the road where it intersects the highway through Rio Rosa. And there's a, a forest or uh, ranger station there called the Smoky Bear Ranger Station. Well, we stopped in there and started talking to people, what we're doing and what we're looking for. And I asked the guy there, do you know of somewhere of foundations? Or, we're looking for foundations, which would be the, the site of a CCC camp. Oh yeah, right across the street, he said. Across the street, we drove right by it, never saw it. Here it is. And that upper left photo shows where the, the ranger station, uh, the ranger office is, and some of the big foundations there. I'm not sure what this one was. Uh, uh, some structures of various types, but that was the old camp, F-54, right next to the ranger's office. It is easy, if, you, if you're not looking in the right direction, sometimes it's easy to miss these things. Number seven, DG 39, Tularosa, just west of Tularosa, uh, east, pardon me, of Tularosa. Here's an old picture of it, it's the 1930s. Looking to the, to the east, looks very neat, looks well organized, there, the barracks there and some of the office structures, other structures, or to the left. This one, I thought would be easy to find. It looked like it would have made a, a, 
an indelible imprint on the ground. Well, not to be. This is a Google Earth image. Uh, this is Route 70 on the bottom. And there's a road sign that said Cottonwood Springs. We drove out there. And uh, everything to the left of that road to the left, uh, the dirt road on the right there, is uh, private land. Uh, and you can see the clear trace of the camp uh, where things were at the outline. It's going to be there for centuries, probably. But it's all on private land. There's nothing left. I don't see any foundations or anything. And this is the fate of some of the camps. They're on private land now. Nothing left. Lost history. Anyhow, this is one of those camps where you can't do any more. And here's the last example. Uh, Soil Conservation Service Camp Number 6 at Fort Stanton. This is a fascinating place. Uh, and its story involves a German cruise ship. Who would have thunk it? Here it is, though. Fort Stanton. And I'm going to tell you some of that story. And then lead into the camp itself. Here's a Google Earth image of the Fort Stanton State Historic Park. That big thing in the middle. And the highway, New Mexico 220, running from the lower right and then going up to the upper upper right. Uh, and there was a CCC camp right across that little creek, that little creek on the north edge of the historic site. So we're going to be talking about the camp. Here's a picture of the SS Columbus. This is a German cruise liner, a luxury cruise liner. It was built in 1923, and it ran around the world a couple of times. It made regular runs from Europe to the Caribbean. Uh, it was top of the line. And this is the story of that ship. I'm going to go back to this. This ship was at sea in the summer of 1939. Well, what happened in 1939? The beginning of World War II. In September the 1st, 39, the Germans invaded Poland and the war started. But right away, Great Britain declared war on Germany and things got very difficult. Well, during the summer, this ship was at sea, heading to Cuba. The war broke out, and the captain of the ship said, what do we do? Radioed back to his home port, and he said, look, get to your port, to Havana, and get rid of your passengers. There were about 750 passengers, about 550 crew, about 1,300 people on the ship. Well, they dumped their... Uh, there were passengers off at Havana, and the captain went, what do we do now? Well, he said, well, go to Veracruz, Mexico, and wait a while and see what happens. He did so, and they sat there for four months trying to decide what to do. Well, around December, they were instructed, make a run for it. Try to get to your home port in Germany. So the captain did so. He had over 500 crewmen aboard. He made a run for it, and everyone knew that ship was there. The British were out there. The Americans, we were not at war with Germany, but we had ships at sea, and everyone was looking for this ship. Well, they made a run for it, but they didn't make it. The British uh, British destroyer intercepted, threw a couple rounds across the bow, and the captain of the German ship was at, did as he was instructed. He opened up the seat cocks, set the ship on fire, and it went to the bottom. And all the crew were offloaded into lifeboats. And at that time, there was an American cruiser also in the area. Remember, we were not at war. And the cruiser picked up all these guys, all these Germans, and took them to Ellis Island in New York. And being not at war, these crewmen, these German crewmen, became guests of the United States. Well, Ellis Island, no one knew what to do with these people. But someone said, look, let's get them to the, to the West Coast. Maybe we could throw them aboard ships and send them to Japan and get them home somehow. Well, 
They threw him on trains in the early part of 1940, put him on trains and sent him to the San Francisco Bay Area. That's going to be our next picture. Here's San Francisco. This is a modern uh, Google Earth image. You can see San Francisco, Alcatraz Island. And up on the top is Angel Island. And this is where these guys were sent. They spent about a year here as guests of the United States. But uh, toward the end of the year, there was a fire on some of the structures that were used as barracks and facilities for these guys. And it destroyed a lot of the, of the infrastructure. And people are saying, where are we going to send these people? What are we going to do with them? Well, someone came up with a bright idea. Uh, there's an abandoned camp, CCC camp, out in the middle of nowhere in New Mexico. We can use that. All the structures are still intact. It can be used. And it's next to a, a, a hospital. Uh, they've got a power plant there with electricity. It, it'll work. So in early 1941, they were thrown on top of, uh, thrown onto a, a train and sent to New Mexico, to Carrizozo. And from there, they were put on trucks and sent to this abandoned camp, SES-6. In the middle of winter, the snowstorm. Back to our Google Earth image. There, again, is the camp on the upper part. That's where they went, and Fort Stan down below. When they first got here, they occupied the existing structures, and the at this time, some of the men, the older men and younger men, had been sent on their way. But some four four hundred fifty uh, German military age men were sent here. They occupied the buildings, but they expected the war to be over pretty soon, so they didn't do any improvements. They just sat there and waited for the war to end. Well, they sat there and they sat there, but it didn't end. This shows you something about it. At the lower left was a camp, uh, a map of the, uh, the CCC camp with all the structures there. And in the, in the lower right are some shaded structures, you notice, some grays and blacks. These are structures that were added by the Germans to embellish the camp and make it more inhabitable for 400 people. You know, the CCC camp was built for 200. They had to make it bigger. Here's another picture looking to the southeast of the CCC camp. This is taken at the end after the camp was abandoned, but all the structures are still there. This was a enlarged POW camp is what it became. Uh, and across the, the creek was the Army Hospital. Notice all those little structures at the, at the very top. They were tents for, for uh, people with tuberculosis to isolate themselves and avail themselves of the clean New Mexico air. Here are some of the structures that are still there. This is, this is a fascinating place. In the upper right is a couple of the, the extent structures. On the right of that picture are, is an old recreation hall that was built by the Germans. And to the right is the front gate of that, the Air Bauf, 1944. This is a recreation building. And only in the, uh, the, the late 90s did the roof fall down in the structures, a wreck today but it's still a fascinating place. The Germans, after they realized they're not going on Europe for a while, they built a swimming pool, a swimming pool. And they got the concrete that, that was contributed or, or donated to them. And they built this structure. It was, a, it was a main swimming pool. And that's what it looks like today. And the lower right is a picture looking down from the hill and some of the existing structures down below there too. This is a great place to spend a day. Not only can you visit the Fort Stanton State Historic Park, they got a wonderful uh, gift shop and visitor center. Uh, 
You notice there in the, the center right, there's a P. There's a little parking area. And it's not labeled. There's no, it's not really designed to be a parking area, but there's a, an area where a few cars can park. And there's a trail that begins just to the right of the parking area. It's a foot trail. And there's a little sign that down below saying something about uh, uh, how far the the trail goes. Uh, it's just a foot trail, no signage at all otherwise. And you walk down here, follow the creek a little bit, cross the footbridge at the letter B, continue on your way, and you're in the middle of the camp. It's only a quarter mile, and it's a fascinating place. You could do it all in one day, and it, it's about as interesting as you could get in New Mexico. Anyhow, at the end of the war, these guys were all repatriated and sent back home. Right after Pearl Harbor in 1941, December 41, these guys were no longer guests of the U.S. They were POWs. Barbed wire went up around this structure, uh, and although they weren't treated like typical POWs, they weren't allowed to go where they wanted to. Anyhow, that's some lost history. Back to this, this is just a reminder about what the greatest generation was. You remember? The CCC is a, a phase that was sandwiched between the Great Depression and World War II. A few words about the CCC alumni movement. You're right around in the 1970s. This is about the time where all these CCC guys were reaching retirement age. And when you get to retirement age, all of a sudden you have the time to start researching things like past history, uh, genealogy, family history, things of that sort. Well, a lot of these CCC boys, alumni now, uh, got together and had their coffee clutches, and a number of them were, were still in various areas, and there were a lot of them, a lot of them. So they decided to form chapters or, or groups that would meet from time to time. This idea caught on. Chapter one was in Sacramento, California, started in 1977. Eventually, over 20, 22, 23 years, a total of 178 of these alumni chapters were formed. This was a nationwide movement. These guys didn't want the CCC to be forgotten. And they also just enjoyed getting together with their old buddies. We had one chapter in New Mexico. It was in Albuquerque. It was chapter 141. These numbers were sequential. Uh, it was an on every time a new chapter came around. Uh, 1988 was formed. And there was an umbrella organization above all these that kind of coordinated their their efforts called the CCC Legacy. And this, anyone trying to learn more about the CCC or to access photographs or anything, any kind of history, the CCC has a wonderful website, a wonderful resource. Check it out. Well, Chapter 141 shut down in 2018 when the last of the boys passed away. Very sad occasion. And my wife and I were with them to the bitter end. And we miss them all, the wonderful guys. Here's where the, the 178 chapters were scattered through the country. There's our number 40, 141. Uh, there's also a chapter notice in Texas. That's the Fort Worth area, chapter 123. Notice the clusters, California, up in the Pacific Northwest, a lot of them uh, around uh, the Great Lakes. Uh, New England had quite a few, Florida. As of the end of 2018, there's our one chapter closing down. And the chapter 123 is still going. And it's made up of not CCC boys, but their grandkids, their kids, and people who are just interested in keeping that alive. Texas, Texas had quite a few state parks that were built by the CCC. And uh, uh, their legacy is quite important there, as as 141s in New Mexico. 
one of the principal ways that the CCC boys are trying to perpetuate their, their legacy is to encourage the installation of these slightly more than life-size bronze statues, the CCC worker statues, to get one in every state, at least one in every state. Well, New Mexico's got three. These were not put up by the CCC, but they were encouraged and encouraged by the CCC. There's one in the upper right, Elephant Butte, and these were given sequential numbers as they were installed. This was put up by the YCC, which was a uh, kind of an offshoot of the CCC, made up of uh, young people here in New Mexico uh, in recent times. And they put this one up. Uh, over there in the upper right, number 49, this is put up with state, uh, with help from the state legislature, as well as private donors. And down below, number 67, was put up by the Forest Service, uh, pardon me, the Park Service in uh, Bandelier, uh, by the amphitheater. Um, so that's ours. And this is where the statues are today. There's our three notice put up in 2008, 9, 2017. And you can see where the others are. Uh, I understand there are 77 now. They're trying to get a 78th, but uh, these things cost around, uh, anyhow, with inflation now, something on the order of $30,000. So these are serious things. So they don't pop up like uh, like blockbusters or, or uh, uh, anything like that. They, it's a serious undertaking. Okay, here's uh, the boys want to be remembered by their statues, the remains of their campsites. We talked about some of those today. There are 90 of them in New Mexico. And of course, their conservation work it was everywhere. Uh, they built the state parks, they did land improvement, they uh, did a lot of work to, to improve the public lands. It's everywhere. Okay, we're going to wrap up now. One little thing, just a couple words some sources to learn more. Here are two things. The Richard Meltzer's book, he's a retired professor of history at UNM's Valencia uh, campus. He wrote this in, in, in 2000. He published it in 2000. And there's an interesting story here. Uh, <laughs> Richard, uh, his publisher went out of business. It was Yucca Press in Las Cruces, they went out of business. And Richard learned that Yucca Press had a storage unit with boxes and boxes and boxes of unsold books. And they were gonna throw them in the dumpster. Well, Richard said, oh no, let me get those boxes. And he offloaded those and put them in his basement. So he's got quite a stash. They're also available on, on Amazon. The other book, in turn, was done by this James McBride. This came out, I think it was 2000. I didn't put the date, I think it was 2003. That's a wonderful book about the SS Columbus, full of photographs. This guy was in the military for years. He retired, went back to school, got his master's degree in history at UNM. Uh, and based on his thesis, he published this book full of photographs. It's just an excellent source. It's also available on Amazon uh, and it, it's available too at the gift shop at the Fort Stan historic site. Uh, and uh, the last, that's where we got ours. It's a wonderful book. I recommend them both. And finally, my book, Camps and Campsites of the CCC in New Mexico, came out in 2000. It's available uh, by Amazon also. So I encourage you, if you're interested in more, to find out where the camps are, what they look like, which ones are worthwhile checking out, which ones are best to ignore, and there are some of those. Uh, check them out. Anyhow, the CC boys are all gone now. Here's a bumper sticker that we used to pass at at our meetings. Uh, but their legacy is everywhere around us. Uh, and I thank you for your attention. And I had fun putting this together. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. And I hope your 
curious enough to check these sources out and get out in the field and visit some of these camps. Well, thank you very much.